Those of you, and I think everyone knows uh, Joe Ball, he's, um, uh, we, we had him come and talk at the AHS a couple of years ago, and uh, it blew me away in that it was the first time I'd ever seen someone really reinvent the way an animal's being kept in captivity. And uh, we'd all had ideas on how blue tongues were to be kept, and we were all feeding them um, uh, whiskers jelly meat and giving them three different types of fruit and thinking that was the way it needed to be done. And then Joe came along and completely tipped the whole thing on its head. And uh, it's, uh, it's been quite amazing to see what he's been able to do. He's been uh, very um, clever in the way he's harnessed social media and um, has also uh, now branched out into macaws and monitors and a whole host of other things. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for our next speaker, just before dinner, can you please put your hands together for Mr Joe Ball? And do I, I need to be speaking into these, obviously? So I need to speak into these constantly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah why not? Okay, so everybody ready? What I'm going to attempt to do over the next sort of 45 minutes is um, give a talk on my journey with Australian lizards, basically. And it's basically st in stark contrast to some of the stuff that you've, you've just heard. It's, it's modern day reptile keeping, it's morph genetics, it's reptiles in conjunction with the internet, and yeah, it's, it's how we've evolved or gone backwards. So um, let's have a look at it. And um, aptly titled, the first thing I want to cover is um, blue tongue genetics, which we've, which after a, an article that I wrote in a, in a magazine, we've called it blue genes. So um, can everybody hear okay? Yep, good. I'm going to attempt to talk in the middle of the stage too. So hopefully that works. built this specifically for my own idea to keep blue tongues. You've got a, an outdoor area here um, so they can come out fast and sort of hold there so you can get back inside the uh, skin that likes to be into the adult space and stuff. And that was the intention. And it's got a slit down the middle there. And um, yeah, that's better use. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, that, that was a, a woodwork exercise one, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, maybe a bit longer. Um, and that, that evolved um, once, once doing that, as we do with reptiles, we started with that and chucked a couple of blueys in there, blueys that I got from Mr. Pales down there some sort of 12, 13 years ago, maybe. Um, I then decided to evolve this further and um, sort of take on my learnings from the, the previous cage and sort of mass produce the idea. Um, it's basically a rabbit hutch that uh, takes on board the rabbit hutch design but allows um, low elevation sunlight through the sides for winter basking um, 
that kind of thing, but it's lifted off the floor so that you don't get the really cold, wet temperatures that the floor offers or, or can offer. And that's what it looks like there. So uh, you've basically got blue tongue hutches. And obviously in Australia, if you, if you go back to that, you imagine a 40 degree day, we're, we're going to get cooked lizards. So um, that's, that's your answer for sun deluge. And it's also the answer for rain deluge too. On a good rainy day, the rain just runs off the front of those. And obviously on a 40 degree day, that's, that's, that's pretty shaded under there, especially as those tops are, are um, raised off the actual cages. It literally is a shade sail above each one. And that's what they look like inside. So you've got the, when you lift the lid, you've got the blues at the back and their hay or whatever substrate you chose. And then at the front, you've got some marine grade carpet, which can be washed and uh, gives them a basking area. There's some sort of smaller designs for individual lizards there, so. Okay, so um, then we get on to diet. And when I first started keeping these, these lizards, I'd give them dog meat, whatever, you know, the, the, the word around the block, if you like, was you feed Bluey's dog meat or heaps of vegetables, this, that, and the other. And yeah, lo and behold, if you do that, you just end up with a, if you like, a shitstorm right through every single cage. And um, just basically a lot of inconsistency. So I look for a method which, taken on from my agricultural background, if you like, which allowed me to keep food available all the time. Because obviously with wet foods in the, out, out, you know, in the outdoors and the indoors, you're going to get a fly-blown situation and something that's not sustainable. So um, I originally tried with this lizard food here, which was created by Veta Farm, and kept that available all the time so that you'd got that literally 24-7. Had a moderate uptake. So then I sort of switch to this stuff here, which is a cat food, which another bluey keeper was actually doing. He'd sort of tried some just because he'd run out of other food, and it just sort of circumstantial, really. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll give that a go. So I sort of tried all the different Purina cat foods and some of the other brands and found that you could basically cover 70% of your blue tongue's diet by just having that available permanently. Of course, animals are animals. Some of them will, some of them won't. So you also have what, what I've now evolved to is I keep that available 24 seven, other than for fat animals, obviously animals that are overweight, that's, you know, you, you've, you've got to curb your food back a little bit there, but um, you have that available 24 seven, then once a week you can go over the top with something a little bit more elaborate, which um, incorporates a few more sort of um, niceties if you like. You've got turkey mince there, mix it with a bit of dried lizard food, put some peas or some other veggies in there, eggs, calcium, that kind of stuff, just to sort of drive appetite and to keep them rolling. Incidentally, that stuff has D3 um, in it. So much to my surprise, there's quite a, quite a few of those um, dog and cat dried foods that actually have a pretty balanced diet for a lizard in there if you can get them to eat it. Okay, and that's, that's sort of what um, one of the tubs that I've incidentally used. I, d I keep, lizard, keep blue tongues inside and outside. I'll, I'll get onto that in a second, but th that tub there is a typical layout for one that I would keep inside. That's a, um, uh, a tub there that's a metre long, believe it or not. You've got the dims there. It's a metre long, 55 wide, um, and about 20 high, which is high enough for a blue tongue skink. So um, that's your layout there. So we, we've looked at the, the outdoor. This, this is how I would keep them indoors. So you've got a full, a full range of those tubs there, obviously with heat cord at the back. So you've got full temperature control, with, uh, full temperature gradient, that is, with heat at the back and a cold spot at the front. And um, the reason why I do both is I found that all lizards are totally, you know, blue tongues are totally different within, 
you know, within the species. You'll keep a rack full of blue tongues and in that, say in that rack there with eight animals in, you'll get five of them that absolutely thrive. They eat all their food, um, keep putting on weight. Nothing wrong with them at all. They breed every year. And then you'll get three others that will pace the tub. They want to get out. They hate it in there. Um, then you stick them outside and they're fine. But then conversely, you'll get some outside that they hate it out there too. They'll stop eating. The temperature gradient's too much. They can't handle hot days, then cold days. They stop eating. They rub their noses on the sides of the tubs. They want to get out of there. They feel like you know, they're, they're potential prey because of the sort of visibility, etc. Stick them in there, and then they start eating again straight away. So, you know, when you look at these debates and racks over outside and four-foot glass cages over this and that and the other, there really is no straightforward answer because a lot of these animals are fairly individual. I've even had them in four-foot cages where, you know, with a glass front and a blue tongue, just hates it, hates to be seen. Every time you walk into the room, it just bolts for the hide, you know? You know, and, and when you think about it, that's pretty understandable that, you know, you're there on display for everybody and you're an animal that literally fucking hates that, you know? Like it, and you put them in one of these tubs and you shut the drawer on it and it gets to go in there and get under the newspaper, get in the paper, da da da. It's as happy as Larry. So, that, you know, that, that, that's my approach to keeping blue tongues. It, it's it's multi-pronged. It has an answer for every single situation, in my opinion, and that's based on experience. It's not, not based on anybody else's opinion. It's just based on what I've found from my first days of building an outdoor cage to then setting up a load of racks and finding that, you know, that, that there really is more than one solution that's required to house multiple, you know, large numbers of, of this particular species. So, so yeah, that's, that's that. That's a, that's a glance at, at um, uh, blue tongue husbandry, if you like, or the way I do it. And it incorporates quite a lot of the modern techniques, some of the old ones. Um, but yeah, that, that's the way I, I feel like I've evolved it and I've found a solution for what I'm about to present, which is sort of a, a trip through genetic blue tongues and keeping large numbers. Um, some of this stuff straightforward. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to labour it. Um, so why keep a blue tongue? Well, it's fun, basically. As we all know, we all keep reptiles for fun. But over, over, over other animals, they're very easy to keep. They have a low UV requirement. Can be maintained easily, like I've just um, covered. Um, dried food. You know, you don't need so many live foods. You can get away basically without insects or anything like that. You know, not like dragons. You know, blue tongues are almost like a pig. You know, they, they, they just eat dog food, cat food, anything you put in front of them. You don't, you, don't need, you don't need the more expensive food items. It can be supermarket shelf items that we just covered. So, um, so yeah, a couple more points on there. A range of subspecies that are second to none that we'll look at later too. And more colour morphs than any other Australian species. Now, when I did that, it was debatable and there was a few carpet python breeders that would say, uh, maybe not. But I think since then, the blue tongues have proven that there's more colour morphs in blue tongues than any other species now in Australia. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get on to those. And when I actually wrote that, I said they were more affordable when compared to snakes. I thought I'd leave that up there because actually it's gone the other way now. So. And, um, Live babies, meaning no eggs to incubate for the, for the avid breeder. Okay, so last point on um, husbandry, which is something that I think is important with all, all reptiles. It's um, gender determination. A bit of a nightmare with blueies as it is with um, a, a lot of other reptiles. Females have got shorter tail length, males narrower hips, a longer, more slender tail. Females have smaller and rounder heads and fuller bodies. Males have visible hemipene bulges. So these are all the visible cues. It's about building half a dozen different visual cues to build a case so you can say, right, I think I've got a male or I think I've got a female. So, and in the absence of DNA sexing that avian culture has, that's the best we can do. There is a couple of other veterinary tricks 
one of which I worked with a vet to, to determine, which was to, to put some um, contrast dye in the hemipene pockets there, which you, you basically put, you, you can see it there in the picture, you, it's like a little gel dye which is picked up on um, x-ray and that basically illuminates the, the hemi, hemipenes and you can see there the difference between males and females. So, but again, that's, it's only 90% accurate, which, you know, it's, uh, it has its, has its flaws. Okay, so let's get into the morphs and no morph story is complete without an albino. So the, the first albino blueies were found, I think 15 years ago now, I'm not, not 100% sure on exactly which year, but it's something like that, brought to us by the Snake Ranch team and John Weigel. And I picked up some of these guys sort of three or four years into the program and managed to, to achieve what I believe was the first albino to albino breeding. I'm not 100% sure on that, but this is the first documented one anyway. So you've got albino over albino from the first eastern blue tongues, tiliquus, skinkoides, skinkoides. So um, there you've got mating process, gravid female and the first litter. So... Uh, in this litter, you've got the sharper eyes amongst you there. We'll see that you know, some of those are a bit better than others. You've got a couple of, there's a bit of a kink spine there. Some of these were sort of lacking in function a little bit in the back end, so on and so forth. But um, there was one that lacked a bit of ne motor neuro function too. But uh, over the 10 lizards, there was probably seven of them that were good, six, six or seven. But still, um, needed some work. But that, that, that was one of the good ones. So. so what I decided to do with those, much to my um, sense, was, was cross it in, into specific with a, another subspecies. This is a, a Kimberley blue tongue. And I kept these for a couple of years at the time. And what I noticed about these guys was just how strong they were compared to a, a standard wild type Eastern. They had certain traits that were much more conducive to captive breeding. Um, yeah, just seemed to do better at, at, at all facets. They ate better, they bred better, they had bigger litters, the animals were stronger, grew to a larger size, just, just had general vigor about them that the, that the Eastern blue tongue um, just didn't have and I, I've always had problems with eastern blue tongue morphs because of that and it's not until you introduce that northern blood that you actually manage to to make some viability across across the morph so this was the first one this was eastern albino over Kimberley northern and there you can see some of the litters from the just pure Kimberley northerns themselves big nice big strong animals um, big litters exactly as I've just described. So um, that's some of the colour range that, w that was in the Kimberley animals and it, they actually incidentally carried another morph at the top there which I'll look at later which was uh, an exanthic or anery there. So um, there again is the animals that I use, uh, used a gravid female and then there you've got your, uh, the, these are het, al het albino, 50% eastern 50% Kimberley. So uh, we're now looking at pairing this F1 generation back to one another to see if we can improve the standard of the albinos that, that, that we were currently looking at. So there that photo indicates the pairing. So you've got the male on the left, female on the right, and there was your litter. So you'd got one in four albinos there. So a bit of a blurred photo, but that, that just show, shows the litter itself. And then these are the resultant animals. And I believe straight away, looking at that photo, comparing it to the previous photo of the, the mum with babies that you've got, you've got zero kink spines, you've got just an altogether fuller animal with, um, which, which went on to have you know, a lot more vigor and actually increased color and so on and so forth, which, you know, that, you know, new, newbie lizard keepers are always looking for cool things with paint jobs and that, and that, that is exactly what that did. And that, that seemed to coincide with the, the boom in blue tongue morphs, if you like, and gave 
something viable out there that sort of wasn't going to turn around and die on you 12 months later. Um, here these guys are smashing down a bit of um, beef mince. So yeah, that, that's the intense colour that the, the Kimberley blood seemed to infuse in them and give them something totally different to the previous animals. Okay, so going back to what I uh, sort of suggested before, that there was actually another morph within those Kimberley animals, and it was a, an exanthic or an anary, whichever you want to describe it as, but you can see it there in the top right corner there, um, clearer there. So this, this is the opposite to an albino in the sense that an albino takes out all the melanin, so all the black pigment, whereas your exanthic does the opposite, takes out all your oranges and yellows and leaves the animal with a black eye. So you've got sort of a total opposite there to your albino. So within this particular group of animals, you're now getting two mutations come out of the same pairings. You're getting exanthics and albinos in the same litters. And there, there's an example of the black eyes. That that's not actually a black eye, so to speak. It's the eye in the absence of orange. So a standard bluey eye has an, or has an, orange, um, an orange outer ring and a black iris. And then you take the orange out and you're left with a, a black eye. And, th and there it is. In Another picture of it there and there. So yeah, there you can see it there compared to the albino. So you're getting those two specific morphs in the same litter with the wild type there on the left. You've got your wild type colours, exanthic and albino. So, And um, that then, uh, for all you genetic lovers out there, means that you know, not, not only will you get that in the litters, but eventually you're going to get an expression of both animals. So you're going to get an exanthic albino, or what's uh, referred to in the reptile hobby as a snow, and um, that's that guy there. So it's a, a, an albino blue tongue that is also exanthic. So it's taken out all the black and all the orange and every colour that you can think possible. So you've got this basic glowing animal right there. And that's, that's what it looks like as a baby there on the left. And, and that's it as it ages. They do actually pick up some yellow as, as they age. Well, some of them do. Some, some of them end up pure white also. So... Um, and there's a precedent with that um, also in carpet snakes, corn snakes, quite a few other um, genetic reptile breeding programs. So, and there's your snow there compared to your, your albino. So you can see even the difference in eyes there. That's a standard albino and that's your snow's eyes there. Couple more snaps just to show you the difference. And there's, there's the comparison again with the carpet python, the eye colors. Okay, and then just to keep the purists happy, um, and me being obsessed with blue tongues and so on, and decided to run dozens of different projects. This was a project that I did with, uh, I outbred the Eastern Albino to a, a, a Queensland Eastern, so that's a New South Wales Eastern, but I, I decided to pair it to a Queensland Eastern to, to again give some vigour, but, but keep it within the same species and, and see sort of what, what I could achieve there. And these were the resulting heterozygous animals, and within that I was starting to get lavenders. So there you've got a lavender albino blue tongue, so you can see that's infused with, it's also referred to as purple. And, there, and there's a couple of them there. So they're pure Eastern albinos again, but with the lavender. And there's your two animals as adults. So there's your lavender Eastern albino, and there's your snow. Okay, so that's, that's albinism. Next one, which I think is most people's favorite. And um, another one brought to us by Snake Ranch. Uh, Peter Harlow too, I don't know if Peter's here tonight. Have I seen Peter somewhere? Yeah, I think Peter had a, a, a starting point in these. Um, two, these are something found near Bondi, weren't they, Peter? 
Northern Beaches, the first one of these was found. Rick Shine had something to do with it, then Peter, and then Snake Ranch, and, and then um, here we go. So this is uh, another, another genetic morph, works similar to albinism in that it's basically recessive. Some of the uh, heterozygous animals are mildly visual, but at the end of the day, it works in the same way. If you put uh, the, 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 the black over uh, a het, you're going to get half a litter of blacks and the rest are hets. And then if you do a, a total black over black, you're going to get a full litter of black blue is there. So, and to this day, these, these, these animals are probably up there as the most requested animal I, I get asked for, you know, year in, year out with blue tongues. I think it goes back to... Um, the red belly black being the most popular venomous snake. Everybody loves a black reptile at the end of the day. And the, these things just um, seem to captivate everybody's imagination. And you can see why. Okay, so if ulti obviously, or ultimately, it's going to go back to combination again. So the, the question out there at the time was what you're going to get if you put a black bluey over an albino bluey. And I was fortunate enough after two or three years of trying to get a um, black male to mate with uh, a trusty albino female that I had, which is the one that was pictured sort of earlier in the prezzo that seemed to have babies every year for me. Um, and uh, I managed to, 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 you know, these are two pure Easterns too. So this is a pure Eastern project. So you've got um, piper melt over albino and your gravid female again, and there's your litter. So essentially you've got a litter here. So each and every, each one of those animals is gonna be 100% het for hyper male, but it's also 100% het for albinism. Doesn't look very special at that stage, but these animals, which are, these are two of those babies, once these are grown up and paired, we then get um, basically a virtual lolly shop that comes out of each litter. So there's nine different genotypes that come out of a, a double genetic litter, and this is this is this is what would come out of those litters, which I'll show in pictures in a second, but I'll just run through now. So you'll get normal wild type, heterozygous melanistic, heterozygous albino. Heterozygous for albinism and melan melanism, which are your double hets again. You're going to get albinos, you're going to get your hypermels, you're also going to get albinos that are heterozygous for melanism, you're going to also get your hypermels that are heterozygous for al albino, also. And then lastly and finally, you're going to get that ultimate lizard, which is the double expression of both, which is your al hypermelanistic albino, which um, we have here. So there you double hex mating, and then there's your litter there. So that's the first snapshot of the litter. I'll get to a better photo of that on the next slide. There they are, the parents. This is your litter. So you've got your hypermels in the litter. You've got your normals, which could be het, hyper, het, albino, or double hets. Hard, hard to know, or you, you don't really know. Uh, and then in there, you've got, in this case, we had one albino, standard albino, and then we had the ultimate um, hypermelanistic albino, which you'll see more clearly in the next slide. So um, that, that, that's the guy there. Again, these are just baby photos. So we'll see as that guy develops. And that's, that's a more clear photo. You can see that that um, hypermelanistic albino there is totally different there to these two albinos. And that will become more apparent as the animal grows. And I suppose that the best way to describe what that animal was, was going to look like was you were basically getting a black blue tongue and you were adding albinism to it, which basically meant that you were going to take away all the black pigment. And when you look at the belly of a black blue tongue, you'll see that it's flash orange. So really it was telling you that you were just going to pull out the black and have a, a, a flash orange animal. And that is ultimately what it looked like. So there's your baby and there's an adult in the background. They started off sort of quite light and white with sort of orange patches, but as they aged, they became um, 
there it is, there. Uh, it just became this sensational um, fluoro, fluoro orange animal, which I don't think it's really been surpassed from a, a visual perspective since in the blue tongue morph game, but um, yeah, there it is. A little bit different from its wild type cousins, I think, I think you'd agree. And as all these things do, love it or love it or hate it, they all they all they all attract a name. I think that's a, it's a bit of an American um, precedent there. But what I decided to call this animal was a larva, um, and I don't really think it needs any explanation as to why. And there we have it. Okay, so that's three morphs we've looked at. We've looked at exanthic, we've looked at albinism, and we've looked at black blueies or hypermels, and we've looked at the combinations that you can get from those. And then, you know, th there's a few more morphs. This guy, this was something that was brought to us by John Robert Coward and his, his father, um, Rob Coward, up in the, in the Northern Territory some years ago. This is something which I, I think it's pretty much leucistic, but a few people argue the point, but whatever. Anyway, it's a flash white blue tongue. It's not an albino. It's got very much normal eyes. It's normal in every other way, other than the fact it is flash white. Starts off looking like that, and then as it ages, all the pigment seems to wash out shed by shed. So yeah, there are your babies. Um, there's a nice graphic mating snap. Again, another recessive mutation. You've got that, that animal there is the mother to, to the white animals there. there it's, a, it's a pure Darwin mutation. And yes, yeah, so it's a straightforward recessive with nothing visual at, at heterozygous level. Again, and some more baby photos. Also, as with any mutation, there's some anomalies. So while some of them are flash white, there is odd ones that unexplainably are just, you know, it's still the same mutation, but it's got all sorts of different color speckles through it. I suppose you put that down just to polygenic range. And there you have them again. So, <clears throat> and again, it goes back to what can we do with this, you know, as morph, morph breeding always does, it's what can we, once we've produced this morph, what can we do with it? And let's, let's take it back and pair it to a hypermel. And then there we've got the result of that, which is a platinum. This is, this is some of Roger the Dodger Kramer's work here. So you've got um, black over the white northern, which gave you the platinum. So it landed somewhere in between. It was a, a, a flash silver animal. Oh, I'm going the wrong way now. There we go. And then there we have these. This is some of Karen's work. Where's Karen? There. So then we've got white northern over my previously described exanthic or anary blue tongues, which give you um, white northerns with jet black eyes. So that's it there. So it's flash white with jet black eyes. And that basically um, mirrors the black eyed leucistic ball pythons, which uh, a very captive, you know, captivate everybody's imagination in the US reptile market. And there it is again there. And there's, there's three of those double visual expressions. You've got your lava, your snow, your platinum. And then there's a couple more. So this is anery over the, over the black bluey. So what, what happens here is the anery takes out the the yellow and the orange, so your black bluey isn't so black anymore. It's got all the black pigment there, but all the oranges and the yellows are taken out, and you get end up with this sort of, um, you couldn't really describe it, it's silver, similar to the platinum, but sort of totally different too. It sort of has a blue hue to it. So that's your anery hyper. Okay, so that's, that's four morphs that we've looked at. Albinism, anery, hypermel, and white northern, and the different combos that you can make from those. And there they are. You've got platinum, snow, lava, alabaster, 
uh, sun glow, which we didn't cover, but that's the white northern over the albino, and then your blackout bluey, which is your anery hyper, and that's an, another photo of those there. So um, this is where it really does start getting like um, ball python genetics with double and triple and visual, uh, double and triple visual animals. So, and and that's what we move to next. We look at. How can we make triple visuals? How can we get all these mutations into one animal and see what that looks like? And here we have one of those examples. You've got a platinum that's got black eyes. So that's visually exanthic. It's visually hypermale. And it's also visually white northern. There it is compared to a platinum. But you can see it's had all the orange and the yellow taken out of it. And there we have some of the examples of the whiteness of, of albinism when you get, not only do you add anery or exanthic to the albino, but you add white northern to it too. You've got uh, uh, the best example of a snow there, and then you add the white northern to it, and you end up with what can best be described as a moon glow or a pearl. And again, you can see, you know, yeah, there is, yeah, sure, some of these animals are not viable, but I find that in quite a few blue tongue litters, even wild types, you'll get two or three animals that are basically kookaburra food. I'm finding with a lot of these morphs, yeah, yeah, there is some, some unviable animals, but as you can see, a lot of these animals are, are, are reaching maturity and, and, are actual, and are actually breeding fit. So as you can see, there's nothing wrong with the, with the vigor and the, the, the strength of those guys there. And then you know, there's an example of um, two extreme mutations mating together. You've got your mercury, which is your um, anery platinum, mating to your larva. So, you know, it, it goes on with, with those morphs. And also, as I touched on before, you start to get unexplained or harder to explain polygenic anomalies. Your black bluey, basically, when you add some of the other subspecific um, influences, you're getting black blueys that have got this brilliant orange coming through. Yeah, it was there, but it, it, it's before, but it's sort of highlighted further. Okay, so fifth mutation. This is one that's that's in its infancy, but it's another form of albinism and is another Darwin northern. Um, and it's a, what I, I believe is a T plus albino. So instead of taking out all the black pigment a T plus albino just denatures the black pigment and leaves you with a lavender there. So you've still got dark pigment, but it, it comes out in a lavender or a, a brownie sort of hue there. And that's another recessive there, as you can see there next to its sibling. And there it is compared to its... Um, albino cousin. So you've got your T plus albino and your T negative albino there. So there we go. And another example of that. As you can see, they're, they're almost like a pastel, a pastel ball python for those of you that follow ball python genetics. And again, it then opens the door for mixing the mutations up further. You've got a larva there what can you do with the larva when paired to a T plus? What, what different shades and colors can we get? This is all stuff that's, this is very recent that, that's still to come. Okay, and as with, with all mutation programs, you start off with color mutations. You get, you know, you've got your whites, your albinos, your blacks. Then you get pattern mutations too. Like there's a precedent for this in carpet pythons with zebras and jags and so on. This is basically your zebra blue tongue. What they're just called re reduced pattern blue tongues, but for the sake of arguing, this is the, the, same, the same mutation, if you like, as your, as your zebra carpet pythons. Again, as you can see, the pattern's totally disrupted. I've actually seen odd ones of these in the wild too, so these are not unlike wild types, really. You know, this is a, a mutation that would survive very, very well in the wild. And there's a couple of different examples of these. You know, you've got your reduced pattern on the previous one, and then you've got totally patternless there. So again, this is, this is another function that can be used to change the, the look of these animals 
via taking out the pattern. Okay, the, on top of that in morph, morph breeding, you're gonna get some anomalies that are unexplained. And this is one that I found that um, this animal was born looking completely normal, like a normal wild type there. And then over the space of six months, probably about four or five sheds, shed out all of its color and, and pigment. Um, basically, it was unreproducible, and I, I think I produced another one, two of them, but there was no, no method of doing it. It was just something that happened over time. Pretty interesting, though. There's, there's the two that I produced there. So. And then you've got other anomalies here. So you've got um, sort of patchwork where you've got wild-type patterning, but there's pattern stripped out in the tongue and on the feet and so on and so forth, sort of like some kind of chimera, if you like, where you've got two different traits showing at once. And that's, that's another example of a, a wild type that's got, or it's not a wild type, but another anomaly that's come out that, that has pink tongue when it's not an albino. Okay, so that's, that's five, five mutations covered in the skin coides complex. That's your eastern and northern blueies. You then go on to your blotchies. So I, was, I managed to pick this blotchy up from um, um, a guy down in Victoria some years ago, a guy that passed away not so recently now, but he was good enough to give me this animal. And I decided to work with it and pair it to a wild type. As you can see, it had got sort of a, a straight patterning to it. And I paired it to a wild type there and thought, um, I thought I'd start on a line breeding program, if you like, and pick out the stripiest baby, which happened to be that one there. And I thought what I'll do is I'll pair it back to um, dad and see if in a recessive sense or a true genetic sense, there was any, anything within that. And they're the two animals there. And the result, again, was something quite, quite crazy. You've got a basically full patternless animal and more sort of partially striped animals. And these, as they mature, look, um, there's one of the litters, look pretty special. So they're the babies, and then there's an adult alongside one of the babies. So um, totally different to your wild type blotchy. Again, this is another blotchy. So uh, another mutation within the blotches, this is your exanthic or anary, same as your, the, the one we covered previously. So that's your blotchy, that's your, your northern bluey there, as you can see. So it's the same mutation, but in the, in the blotches. And that's a, a project that's still in its infancy. <coughs> and that's the, that's the first one that I've managed to reproduce there at the top compared to a wild type. So. And they're the two blotchy blotchy morphs right there. So you've got your super pinstriped or patternless blotchy and your exanthic there. Okay, so, and this is, this is the theme of how I like to put pictures on the internet as it goes. I like to try and get as many colorful animals in the same picture as possible, um, which is what we're gonna look at in a little while on sort of the use of the internet with reptiles. And this is all the proven morphs in blue tongues in one tub. So you've got your reduced pattern, you've got your patternless blotchy, you've got your T plus albino, you've got your exanthic, you've got your hypermel, you've got your T negative albino, and you've got your white northern there. So yeah, that, that is all your mutations currently in the, in the blue tongue world. Okay, so it doesn't stop there. It's, you know, the, the, these mutations exist in Igurney as too. We've got um, something that I acquired indirectly off Mick Mather. I think he's, he's now gone, Mick, he had to disappear, but these are albino striolata, so Igurney is striolata, and T negative albinism within those, and I was fortunate enough to get acquire this project and um, kick it on, do some outbreeding with it, make it a little bit more viable. Some of them had wonky eyes to start with. You can see that guy up there. That was actually the first one produced. You can see its eyes were a bit recessed, but with some outbreeding, they're now, they're now pretty strong. These guys are um, basically as tough as wild types now. And there they go. 
And then this is another project, again in its infancy, hasn't been replicated yet, but I managed to acquire it. This is a um, uh, albino uh, Egernia cunninghami, so that's a Cunningham skink, so another mutation in the Egernia complex. So that's something to um, look forward to over the next few years. So that's Egernia, that's the morphs in the Egernia. Okay, so there's other subspecies in the blue tongues. Um, not without the morphs, you know, you've got albinism in the, in the western coastal shinglebacks, which, which that's what they are, I don't, I don't have any of those, but um, that's those. You've also got, these are obviously western blueies, this is the western Australia form. Some breeding that I've done with those. And um, also there is a mutation within the southern Australian westerns, ones which I'm just, just starting to work on now. So. You know, there, there is morphs throughout the, throughout the um, Teliqua subspecies range. Not just in your Easterns and your Northerns. And here we have it, here's another colourful picture. Um, some of you purists will enjoy that more. You've got your, basically all your main subspecies of Teliqua without your island populations of shinglebacks and without which probably isn't a blue tongue, really, your Adelaidensis too. So you've got your um, um, Rugosa, 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 Asper. Um, you've got your Centralian, your Northern, your Western. And then you've got your, um, that's actually a Tassie blotchy there, and your Eastern. So they're your main species there, which that's, that's, a, that's another another picture that I managed to get of all those species in the same tub. So that's, that's, that leads nicely onto the next bit, which is a bit of fun, which is sort of my approach and how I use the internet and how I try and get that sort of space of internet. If you like, get your most likes, get your most shares, get your, get your sort of breeding program out there so people can see what you're up to. And um, that's my approach, it's to get as many brilliant animals in one place at once so that you know, it's basically eye candy. Whether they're morphs, whether they're, you know, whether they're wild types, I have an equal love for wild types as well as morphs. So, um, and I actually managed to do a video with with um, a friend of mine, which covered all the Teliqua species, not only the ones that we just covered, but those the the Adelaidensis there, and also those island populations of shinglebacks, <coughs> and. Um, I set up a, a YouTube channel, which enabled me to, 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 to do that stuff. So not only does it cover so the, the video that I just covered, you've got sort of genetic know-how, uh, morph breeding, uh, your different subspecies stuff, how to sex a blue tongue, all sorts of different husbandry tips and tricks, that kind of stuff, which again is an example of you know, where, where herpetology has gone from and two with the, with the use of the internet, we have all this, this ability at, at, at our fingertips to be able to share all of our learnings with, with a wider audience. And that's sort of the, the imagery that I use to, to, to get that stuff across. And that's, you know, that, that, that's another video that I, I, I got up there, which I think sitting at about 15,000 views, uh, which basically highlights just how many people get frustrated with not being able to sex a blue tongue, you know? You would think that the video on colour morphs would have all the views when really it, it doesn't. It's got sort of a, a fifth of that. But when it comes to something straightforward, like which you would think is straightforward, you know, the age old conundrum of sexing blue tongues, that, that, that is by far and away the most viewed video that I, I, I've, I've, I've put up there. Um, and that's actually uh, Denver from K Brothers. Um, these are the different platforms I use, Instagram, um, Facebook, again, to pump all those photos and um, get the visib visibility out there. So, you know, you can see there, not, not only do I put my bluey stuff up, my parenti breeding, uh, my core keeping, all that kind of stuff. So, and different platforms for people to talk and discuss. Um, or I call them the whinge and bitch platform so people can judge everybody, you know. 
Um, I, I love these places because you'll get your five-minute keepers that get on there and think that they know everything and your um, people that think they're part of Peter that can come and uh, tell us that we can't do this and can't do that and whatever. But anyway, that's, that's the free space in which people can do that and they're welcome to do it. Uh, and again, I think, as was discussed earlier, you can make yourself look like an absolute idiot by what you write on those things because it's captured forever. So other things I do online to try and boost profile, if you like, run some, run some competitions. So this one was one where it was, guess the combined weight. So, yeah, no, it was the combined length of all those blue tongues. So I think there was eight blueies there from uh, nose tip to tail end and you won a black bluey. So the person that was closest to that, you won those t-shirts and a black bluey. Another one was guess the gender correctly of all these 12 animals uh, from that photo, and you won the com commemorative bluey coin along with t-shirts and so on and so forth. And again, um, we're gonna get further into the internet stuff and this, I believe some funny stuff coming up. Um, again, that's another example of how I like to get um, as many colourful animals in one place to get that sort of eye candy grab and as many likes and shares as possible. Um, and that's my approach. I did try another approach, which was to stick my ugly mug on there, you know, my ginger mug holding a, a lizard. Um, and there's the wife holding the same parenti there. Um, I actually call this the Peter Birch approach, actually, because Peter, Peter loves to do this. He loves to grab animals, have them bite his face or giving them a little kiss and so on and so forth. I tried this once and sort of ran a, a, a little thing, uh, you know, which, which picture gets the most likes, wife or ginger husband, and I, I came nowhere near. So I, I thought I'd be, better, better pull my ugly mug off the internet. Well, uh, I, I did have one other crack at it, and, th and this, this was one where I, I um, thought I'd hold all my as many as my beautiful colour morphs in, in, in one armful as I could and take a photo. And um, it went fairly well. Well, it, when my head was cropped off it. And you'd got, suddenly you'd got the same picture with Zac Efron's head on it in the States. And then in South Korea, you'd got, um, I don't know, an animated version of it. Um, when your Hyungs ask why you bought 10 blue tongue skinks, I think Hyungs mean your, your respected elders. So I think that told me that, yeah, I need to, need to get my ugly mug out, out of the photo. And um, I went viral, but not me. And so I, I went back to my tried and trusted formula, which was just to get as many of the cool critters that I'd got in one photo as possible. In this case, um, as much green as we can get in one photo, which that was pretty hard to achieve, I'll tell you. Um, and then again, with the birds that I keep trying to, you know, trying to get the same sort of concept, I've recently, over the last uh, 18 months, stepped into uh, macaws and some of the photo opportunities that these guys give are just remarkable. They really are. And... Um, just to give an example, I'll go back to what I described as Peter Birch photos. Um, not really just Peter, to be fair. And, and I like them. It, it, it works for these guys. You've got Jay here from Prehistoric Pets. I call these, call these reptile accounts that these are the super reptile accounts. He's got 1.4 million followers. You know, he's got um, his big iguana there on his head. And this guy, he, he's the master of it. He gets all these big retics and everything all over him. He gets famous people in there. And he, yeah, this, this, is, this is proper commercialization of reptile keeping. And good on him, I think, because it, it, de it definitely raises awareness of reptiles and gets more people involved. It does have negative aspects, sure. But what doesn't? You know, when we're keeping animals in this, this current climate, there's always somebody that wants to tell us we can't do this and we can't do that. And uh, I believe while ever there's Jay, and while ever there's um, Brian here, or Peter, um, <laughs> we're always going to have some cool photos. I, it, always from the, the best one of Peter was when he was kissing a blue tongue in it uh, recently, and we got it was just filled with comments of half of them negative, half of them positive. But for me, it just raises the profile of reptiles. People telling Peter that he can't kiss his blue tongue. Well, yeah, well, I think he can. <laughs> 
and, and he did so that day. And, it, and, and, and this is the sort of imagery that um, you've got Brian here with, I'd say he probably got 500,000 followers now. I think he actually shut down one of his pages and started again. So I don't know. Um, okay, and th this is the other approach. Um, as much of your um, naked flesh as we can get in there with a reptile works for me. I like that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, works on the likes, shares. Yeah, it seems to go well. And then we've got this approach. We've got Buddy here. Um, everybody's friend, Buddy. This is, this, is another, this is the shock approach. You know, we've got, can we hold the most dangerous snakes in the world free handled with no, no, no due diligence towards sort of safety at all? We've got Buddy there holding a coastal tie and we've got him holding an Eastern Brown. Um, I believe that's what they are anyway. Um, I like that too. Why not? I'm not one to say no. There's plenty of people I would tell you that in the comments below all that stuff that have plenty to say, but there we go. Although that does go wrong and Buddy gave a live example of that. He was there holding two death adders in the palm of his hand. I think it was a Friday night at about five o'clock. And then by eight o'clock, that was the photo we posted. So, you know, that, that, that is a real live example of... Um, Buddy's antics that went wrong. So, love it, hate it. That's a little snapshot of um, reptiles on the internet. Some of it, some of it's great. I like it all. Um, it's up to the consumer at the end of the day. A couple of other things. I, I, you know, I, I, I pursue some learning stuff with with veterinary. I've got Josh Linus. Uh, up my way, a specialist reptile vet. We've done so, a couple of blue tongue. Um, yeah, we've cut a couple of blue tongues open and saved babies that are about to die and that kind of stuff. So, a um, couple of different things, C-sections and so on, which is basically unheard of in blue tongues, but we managed to, we managed to successfully achieve that on, a, on an animal there. Um, Ultrasounding, that's a parenti there, but ultrasounding for gravid animals or gender determination, that actually works as well as anything on an adult parenti, but um, yeah, there we go. So, um, expos and the like, taking the visibility of reptiles further, taking my passion to wherever you can get it to. I'm not the best supporter of, of expos, but I get along to one or two of them, um, using the best visual aids possible to get these awesome animals in front of everybody. So yeah, that's blueies, that's morph blueies, a snapshot of um, modern day reptile keeping in line with the internet. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I do have a second Prezzo that I'm happy just to run through, which is a bit of eye candy on monitors, um, which whilst everybody's eating, um, which I think we can get up now too. It's only going to take about 15 minutes. So how are we looking for time? Yeah, we still got time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, so um, happy for you all to talk away, whatever. I know we're all eating, but I just want to skim through this. This is, this is um, 
my keeping and breeding exploits with what I'd have to say are my two favourite lizards of all time. So we've got Varanus prasinus, the emerald tree monitor, and Varanus giganteus there. So again, that's my attempt to try and get both animals in the same photo. What I did there was try and get the prasinus on a, a log that was closer to me to try and get that depth perception so that we could get both animals in there. You know, there's no, tri there's no trick photography in that. That literally is uh, as is. Okay, so uh, the old Parenti, a favourite of mine and I think a favourite of quite a few people in here. So, um, inspiration to a lot of Aboriginal art. I think you can see why there on the patterning on the body. Um, a really gentle captive probably of all the big goannas, the easiest to keep in my opinion. Second, uh, sorry, I think third or fourth in size to the Komodo dragon. Obviously that's a model there, but one that sort of resides in my backyard. So that's the biggest of all the, of all the Varanus family. Then you've got the uh, Asian water monitor, which would be number two. Then we've got Parenti, probably sits at three or four, dependent on who you speak to. Um, this was my first setup that I set up some years ago in a previous, previous home, sort of three by three meter cages. Deep sand substrate of about sort of 300 mil so that when these guys do breed, you can harvest the eggs. You're not, you, you're giving, you're basically making their entire cage a, um, a, a nest box. Um, like I said, a very... A very happy captive. These guys just sit there and pose, seem to pose, pose for you all day long, especially the big ones. And this pair just seem to sit there and hold one another's hand. And um, yeah, that was just a real life photo that I actually had done into a mural. So this was this is this is where I sort of stepped it up at my new place and decided to set up a bit of a uh, a, a parenti haven, if you like, and. Um, I bought a, a, a bigger block and thought I'm going to set up some big cages. So um, this is the start of the substrate that I used for these guys. So you've got um, a whole bank of three by three metre cages. You can see the perimeters of those there. And then um, the first layer of substrate to go in, which was some, very, you know, the larger grade river rock with a, a sand base over the top. And then um, aviaries, which were erected on the, the wooden perimeters around. So you'd got uh, the option with these, that each of these is three by three meters, or you could have a six by three to three meter full, full cage. And that's them at completion. And, um, the, the, these are the animals inside the cage. I actually put a, an old trailer in one of them, which offered the, the perfect um, ability to thermoregulate. You know, they could get under the trailer in the day in the heat and bask on the trailer in the, in, in the daytime. And that's them there. And then I thought I'd take it a sta stage further and, and um, paint the backdrop so you've got a six by three meter wall at the back and I got a, 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 a graffiti artist to come in and paint me um, sort of a naturalistic setting there you've got old Skippy there as a backdrop um, you know, with a kookaburra in the tree and the big parentes there feeding these guys you've got day old chickens, basically any, any, any whole prey item that you can throw at them, these guys will eat, but I tend to go for poultry, uh, chicken necks and rats. Um, gender determination can be done in some cases by x-ray, these are two females. Um, visually, you've got hemiclitori there of the females and hemipenes of the males. And again, that previous photo with ultrasounds, you can pick up um, the ovaries of just the females. So,
Not so successful with the smaller ones though, frustratingly. Okay, so breeding parentes, usually made around November, December. Maybe, actually, probably a bit earlier, the further north you go. I'll read, oh, October, November. Uh, mine made in November. Here we've got a gravid female. And here's an example of what I alluded to before. If you give with goannas, which can be a, a, an issue, is giving them a, a suitable nest site. For me, I tend to go the whole aviary bottom floor and, and give them a substrate that's deep enough for them to lay their eggs so that you know they basically have to lay within that area and, the, and they will find a, a place to do so. And they'll dig what is quite an elaborate tunnel, you know, they'll go in, you know, that's the start of the tunnel there, they dig in, go all the way down there, and then they'll turn around at the end of the cul-de-sac there, if you like, lay the eggs, and that's where the eggs were, they were at the, at the back of there, and then come back out of there again, if that's clear to see or not, that, that's where the eggs were, but obviously covered over. Um, they hatch anywhere over 200 days usually and um, this guy here was about 210 days I believe and voracious eaters pretty much from within a couple of weeks of hatching and straight onto the same diet as their, as their parents but obviously chopped up And there we have mum, mum with three bubs. Okay, so yeah, that's a, a little snapshot of parenti breeding. Now we've got these guys, a little bit controversial in Australia. Um, brought to us by Dave Masika. These were um, sort of in 2013. These, these are them on the front cover of Scales and Tails in 2014. They were... Um, uh, confiscated and issued to a keeper in Queensland, which was Dave Mercica, confiscated from an illegal holding and given to a, a legal, where they could be held legally in Queensland. So we've now got a, a legal population of them in Queensland. Um, and um, there you have just how stunning these guys are. So um, the approach I take with these is like with any tropical species, you know, you've got a nice deep mulch, um, plenty of um, humidity and so on, plenty of stuff to climb on um, in the cage below my green tree pythons as it goes. So as you can see, trying to replicate that um, tropical environment. Breeding weight for a female, around 150 to 200 grams. So here we've got an adult female, ready to breed. Um, they tend to breed like most goannas, just sort of at the start of spring, but, but can, can have a longer window being a, being a tropical species. Um, nest site again, I, I, I did a couple of things here. I put a nest box in and I also did the whole enclosure again. And just to prove my theory, they ended up laying underneath the nest box and um, this female here laid three eggs so. and an incubation of 150 days. And hopefully there'll be enough of these soon in captivity and be some relaxing of laws so that other states can keep them. Okay, so that's, that's the wrap. And of course, after that, you've got to get your female back into breeding condition again to go again. So, yeah. Uh, and another little bit of work we've been doing with these guys. Got the, the great Brian Fry there take, taking and recording venom levels, if you like, from the bacteria and venom glands within the prasnus. So... Okay, and that's the wrap. So yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs>